Thank you. Can you all hear me in the back? Hear me okay in the back? Okay. So, let's see. So what we did is, uh, this was a project that came out of a class I teach at our National Defense University called Wicked Problems. And the definition of a wicked problem is sort of there's no agreement on the definition of the problem, much less on the solution. Uh, so as we're working our way through this, and the theme we took during the class was for the, you know, what kind of a national security issue would you have from the replacement of labor by automation and artificial intelligence? And we picked 2030 as our timeline. And the question was, in that time frame, would that be a national security problem? Well, in the middle of the class, then, uh, I got from Jan the uh, question about complexity lens. And so we decided to actually factor that into the class and see what it would teach us. So this is sort of reflecting there. I'm going to break the talk into three parts. And rather than talk, have me drone on for a while, I'm going to break it and ask you for comments at, uh, in, in the middle. <clears throat> so. The first, the questions here are, will there be a crisis? And we picked 2030 uh, because, first of all, uh, it's kind of a period from the workforce where there's sort of a maximum amount of pension baby boomers uh, relative to a relatively small uh, workforce. Uh, also, it's, uh, where it's, it gives time for the exp exponential growth of the uh, capabilities of automation, artificial intelligence to, to really mature. Uh, and it's also beyond uh, two presidential election cycles for America and beyond however many quarterly earnings statements and even beyond two future years defense programs for DOD. So that many people are actually looking at it. And so that was part of the attractiveness. Uh, <clears throat> so then, uh, you know, what kind of concerns might it be? And the particular focus here was could you tap into the explosion of innovation in private sector adult education and see if you can apply some of that innovative learning to mitigate some of the consequences of this? Then how can complexity lens contribute and then uh, is, what research program could come out of this? And where we're going to go with this is actually trying to help design a research project or search agenda rather than coming up with the answers themselves. Einstein has a quote that basically says, if you have an hour to solve a problem, spend the first 59 minutes trying to understand it. And so we spent a fair amount of time trying to frame the problem. How much unrest is likely to be? Will this be a security concern? I mentioned why 2030. A wide range of views. Uh, most people agree that only a few will thrive on the tech change. But others said, look, this, as all other technological changes have done, uh, the overall size of the pie will increase. Uh, there'll be more goods and services and wealth created. And so overall, everybody will do better. And then others said, oh, no, the more jobs will be displaced than they are created. The inequalities between winners and losers in the economy is going to increase social tensions. And this can lead to radical ideologies and migration, protectionism, uh, anti-immigration, and so on and so forth. We were particularly concerned about the youth bulges, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, megacities, and the Islamic world. And what could it do for radical, radicalization there? So these are just a set of questions. Uh, again, we, we use this to frame the problem, not definitive answers. But you know, what is the space and what are the drivers? Who are the stakeholders involved? The US is primarily focused on a policy issue of the United States. So it clearly needs to be done generalized for others. But what are the authorities? What are the statutes we have to deal with? Um, Public-private, how could you actually get the different stakeholders to work together? Uh, it, how would the international community differ from what the U.S. position might be? Suppose we did nothing. Uh, what would happen? Um, is this going to really become a labor crisis? And there was a fair amount of dispa debate about this. If so, how do you mitigate the effects? And if it's a labor crisis, then does that become a national security crisis, so national security threat? So that was sort of the scoping. Underpinning all of this was the issue of the rate of check, check change. And although this is talking about computing power per unit cost, it really just reflects what happens with technological doubling uh, at various periods. In this case, the red line is if technology is doubling every 18 months. Uh, you say, OK, it means a year and a half and now I've got uh, my iPad has, or my, has a you know, 100 times more power than it's now. But in five years, it's 900 percent. In 10 years, it's 10,000 percent. And in 15 years, it's 100,000 percent. So 
even if it's only a two-year doubling period, it's still 20,000% increase by 15 years. So a linear projection just cannot work, and the problem is we tend to linearly extrapolate from where we are now. Uh, the other point is that it's not just info. Uh, bio is changing even faster than, uh, than information technology is. We saw something yesterday that talked about how the um, cost of solar panels is dropping at about the same rate as Moore's Law. So the whole batch of converging technologies that are changing really rapidly. There's a very good TED talk by a guy named Reiner Schratz, and he talks about uh, his prediction is there will be a global workforce crisis. He's focused largely on the German economy. But he says there'll be three components. First of all, because of the lowering birth rate, there will, in fact, be an overall labor shortage. Um, there'll be mismatches between the job requirements and the skill sets in the sense that there'll be a very high demand for high-skilled workers, uh, and the education system isn't really producing them. On the other hand, there'll be a lot of people with low skills who won't be able to find jobs. And this is going to lead to the migration of labor across borders, which is going to lead to various sort of you know, anti-migration tensions and things like that. And so his conclusion was, from a national perspective and also from a corporate perspective, you need to start thinking of long-term development of workers as a strategic priority, not just something that happens to show up as a current problem. <clears throat> so the next piece, then, is what's happening in the automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning space. Uh, and, and the particular point here is the rate of change in machine learning. There's another really good TED talk by a guy named Jeremy Howard that talks about uh, the, um, something like the exhilarating and terrifying potential of machine learning. And basically the point is that back in the old days when you could program a computer, it was kind of limited by the size of the program, what you wanted to do. Now there are a whole series of uh, algorithms, the most prominent of which is called deep learning, that basically uh, allow the machine to learn on their own. And as their capability uh, increases, their learning increases. So artificial intelligence is kind of loosely grouped into three categories. Artificial narrow intelligence, ANI, is kind of like a machine plays really, really good chess but can't do much else. Artificial general intelligence is a machine is roughly as uh, smart as a human being. And artificial superintelligence is sort of um, Ray Kurzweil's singularity and, uh, and this type of thing. Uh, ANI clearly is here now in many different areas. Uh, sort of a Delphi uh, approach of experts projects uh, AGI in about 2040 with a plus or minus 10 year variant there. And then ASI in 2060 with about plus or minus 15 years. So the focus in this project was on artificial narrow intelligence and the beginning of the migration to artificial general intelligence. <clears throat> so the synthesis of these various things, and by the way, The Economist had a really excellent summary last October of tech and the world economy, which, which does a pretty good job. So clearly this is going to offer many opportunities. Those who can adapt will thrive. It's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. The cost of entry into the marketplace is near zero. The penalties for failing in most countries are, are near zero. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, the productivity will add good services, wealth, and demand new jobs. You can't even think of right now. On the other hand, there are going to be a large number of people who are not going to be able to adopt to the pace of change. And almost anybody to the right of center on the bell curve in the traditional economy is probably not going to do very well. Uh, and then there are fewer low-end job opportunities. So the net result is probably more income and wealth inequality. At the same time, as you see Davos talking about 1% of the population owning 50% of the world's wealth and things like that. Uh, I mentioned the uh, problem in the youth bulges. And this is not, though, just people at the low end of the income scale. Uh, there are already computers that are doing a better job at reading um, uh, radiology uh, than people are. Uh, and so now what does it mean if you decouple time spent in education uh, and sort of preparation for jobs from the return on investment of the jobs? I'd hate to be a paralegal today with Watson out there able to suck up all the cases and, and, and feed it back. So. Um, we heard yesterday from Carl that 47% of U.S. jobs are potentially at risk uh, in, the, in the labor track uh, uh, from, from automation. So the other thing that's different from the past is the pace of change. I mean, a lot of people say, hey, look, we've always had disruptive technology. Look at the farmers, and, and it's all come in an S-curve. The problem is now is the pace at which the machines are learning. 
And it maybe it's, you know, somebody said yesterday, it's, it's not that it's exponential change, it's that it's a rapidly changing set of S-curves that are actually happening. But never as all these machines are learning faster than anything we have in, uh, in experience to deal with. So what can you do to help the workforce? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Howard says he doesn't think the traditional education and retraining incentives are going to work very well. Because frankly, the traditional jobs are gone. You can't just retrain from being a lathe operator to being a uh, you know, forklift operator or something like that. You really have to learn differently. Uh, so one of the interesting suggestions was could you decouple labor from earnings? Uh, more like a craft or barter economy, things like that. And actually, f this could be beneficial in freeing people up to do things they want to do. There's also a very rich literature about something, things like a minimum wage and something called a basic income, which I think Switzerland is now voting on. But basically, should you have a you know, stable floor income of, pick, pick a number, 28, 32,000 a year, that would eliminate the problem of extreme poverty. Um, so this is obviously going to trigger massively intense debates over those who argue that the market forces have to work versus socialism versus social safety nets. But at least the debates ought to be supported by data. Uh, we have enough fact-free debates in the U.S. political system as it is right now. And so the question, one of the things you'll see at the end is, is a call for let's at least begin now to gather the data to figure out what should be done when the time comes. So there seems to be a potential as high for unrest, scapegoat finding, nationalism. Uh, the Economist said, unless the governments and private sector are particularly skillful in managing these changes, well, that nothing I've seen lately gives me great optimism that says we're going to do this. Um, and so our contention was this ought to be thought of as a national security issue. So in this model, then, we, we looked at what, what might a complexity lens look like. Um, I've been a part for a while of an organization called the International Transformation Chairs Network which is basically within the U.S. Uh, defense uh, academic institutions. And we've always found it useful to try to approach problems uh, across people, organizations, processes, and technology. So the first cut of this was, you know, suppose you took these, and for example, all the papers we write typically need to be written pairwise. So something has to say, what's the impact of people on organizations or technology and processes or processes and organizations? So suppose you looked at the intersections and the interactions at that level as a first cut to see what happens. So in this definition, then, uh, we took people to be uh, the affected workers in the public-private sector. And this is not just the low-end folks. Uh, it could be um, uh, you know, people all the way up to doctors and radiologists and lawyers. But it also has to consider demographics. So aging workers in developing country, developed countries, youth, youth bulges. The managers, business owners, policymakers are covered under the organizations in which they work. The organizations in the course of the course, again, what we're doing was mainly U.S. governments, so it was Defense Department, State Department, Commerce, Labor, Education, uh, allied and partner nations to see how this would affect them as well. Uh, high tech and manufacturing companies, and we high tech in this case largely IT. Manufacturing could be anywhere from additive manufacturing, 3D printing, all the way down to traditional you know, making widgets, uh, labor, uh, institutions of various kinds of learning, and NGOs, but we particularly focus on humanitarian NGOs. And then the processes long list just includes anything you can think of they talk about, diplomacy, trade promotion, alliance relationships, use of force, so on and so forth. And the technology is pretty much uh, the trends we talked about before. So that was the initial cut we took at this. And I'll go through two more cuts we made in the course of the class. So our initial s cut at a complexity lens was these four columns and four rows with the people defined as this and the rows defined as, uh, as laid out here. So let me stop there for a minute and just ask if you have any questions or thoughts. Sir. Um, the assumption is that, you know, this big change is going to be a lot of people who can't adapt. Right. So that's the assumption upon which we're basing here. What I found really interesting yesterday was the speaker who said, you know, and I, I can't remember the details and I don't know much about America, apart from the British have never given them 
Um, <laughs> uh, everything went pear shaped. Um, I think in 1800, 90% or some, a very large percent of the population were agricultural. Right. And now it's a tiny percent. Right. Now, does that not indicate that human beings, in fact, can adapt and do jobs that they don't even know existed because nobody knew what a truck driver was in 1800? I'm just wondering about you know, no, and so the, I mean, the level of adaptability. So actually, one of the questions later on that we, we got in the discussion was, are we underestimating the uh, you know, inherent resilience of people and the genius of the human spirit to, you know, to adapt? Yeah. Uh, and then this, again, comes back to the debate. The debate basically comes down to optimists and pessimists. And the optimists basically say, hakuna matata, it's always worked before. You Luddites have been complaining for a long time that, that it's going to be a problem. It's always worked out. The others say, yes, but the pace of change of the automation and artificial intelligence now is something that's absolutely unprecedented. And if nothing else, it reduces the amount of time that people have to react. I mean, at least in the transition from farmers, to, from 80% from, from farmers to 1% farmers, took about a century, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and so now they're going to be jobs that are going to be um, you know, displaced in, in years, uh, if not you know, decades to years. And so that, I think, is the issue of just how fast can people adapt. Okay. Sir. So have any of these um, kind of strategic questions being discussed, ha have they been discussed in the past? Because this discussion presumably was had before in the United States in the 50s, with the first round of automation, and it was thought that robots were going to replace everybody's jobs. Of course, it didn't happen, but presumably at that time, people were also trying to uh, sort of map out this, this uh, space. So are there, are there, are there all, is there old work on this? <laughs> yeah, so the answer is I don't know of old academic work except that almost all the work you read said this was looked at before in the 50s and or the, the 20s or the 40s and there was always room to adapt. There was always time to adapt and again some people were, there were winners and losers but it happened on a time, excuse me, a time scale that was long enough that allowed for people to change. Uh, and there's a very interesting book called The End of Average, which basically says, you know, you used to be that you could go to high school, graduate from high school, and provide your family with a middle class uh, employment lifestyle. And it's not clear that's going to happen anymore. Tom Friedman's working on a new book now called The World is Fast, notionally. Uh, and his model is uh, there are three driving factors, and one is the market, which in his model, of course, is globalized and flat and quick, and the other next is Mother Nature, climate change, and the third is Moore's Law, which is a shorthand for tech. But one of the points he makes is the middle class used to be a destination, and now it's a journey. Uh, you, you can never really settle in. And so I think that's one of the differences. If you look at the way that labor has, you know, the return, was mentioned earlier, the, the, the return to capital versus return to labor, and return on labor kind of peaked in about the 70s, I think. And it's been flat since about the 70s. And now you have another factor that's coming in, which is the extraordinary rate of change of automation and artificial intelligence. So the question was acknowledging that this has been looked at before, acknowledging that it has always managed to adapt and before, is there something different now that's caused primarily by this rate of technological change? So that's the, that was the background. Okay. So then in the seminar, and it was a really, really, uh, we did this over several weeks, uh, the, the discussion basically fell out across nine broad topics. And labor issues were things like, if you have all this replacement of um, workers by automation, uh, how do you sustain a consumer-based economy? Uh, to what extent can you, uh, can you replace automation, uh, uh, labor, and still maintain a consumer-based economy? What's the uh, learning limitations? How much can this advance learning? How much uh, you know, point of need content delivery and advanced distributed learning actually help? Uh, trade and alliance relationships, right? If we wind up getting extreme nationalists in power in very close alliance relations, alliance countries, would we still want to be allied with them? Uh, what effect does that have? Um, tech change you mentioned, migration. Uh, clearly, you see this uh, uh, you know, across Europe, Asia, the U.S. southern border. Uh, timing of decisions. There was a really general sense 
that this is not a crisis now. Um, but the question is, when will it become one? And when do you need to take what decisions in order to try to mitigate it? And as I'll get to later on, I mean, one of the key questions was, we ought to be educating K through 12 differently. We ought to be teaching kids, uh, the term that came to mind was the looming shadow of the future. So at least they're better prepared as they get into the workforce to be able to make some of their own decisions and understand what's coming down the pike. This inequality of wealth and ways to redistribute it was a core theme. It's probably the core theme of the discussions. And uh, the, the question about could you get to this with minimum wage? Uh, would you need to go to a basic income? Suppose you just let laissez-faire market forces work. Uh, what would happen to the folks who couldn't adapt? Uh, what would be the social safety net? Then role of government, role of private sector. Um, <coughs> So we spent a lot of time then trying to understand what is meant these days by innovative and adaptive learning. Um, so the one point is the innovative learning is not job specific. You're not trying to train somebody for a particular skill. Um, but the focus is how you develop self-directed learners and adaptive expertise. And the point, how do you encourage people to adapt a lifelong recruitment to retirement learning mentality that's supported by point of need content delivery. The US military divides its learning into three broad categories. There's training, there's experiential learning, which is on the job training, and there's education. And right now the training and the education are largely done in brick and mortar institutions. So the question is, uh, let's say you have been in Iraq or Afghanistan and you come back and you say, okay, I'm getting reset, I'm going to go back and learn how to be a combined arms warrior again, and then, oh, time to go to West Africa to do Ebola. I mean, where do you actually you know, provide information to people that quickly to allow them to adjust? So the adaptive learning, uh, depth and specific skills but also the breadth and social skills to reach out and join teams. And a number of engineering schools refer to this as T-learning. So you know, you're, you're the world's best civil engineer, or you're the world's best physicist, but also you know enough about related disciplines so, you're not, uh, so you can be part of an interdisciplinary center. That's, that's sort of the focus of that. Uh, so the question is then, how do you, you know, can you get motivated, persistent people? They're going to have great opportunities. No doubt there's terrific opportunities out here in this. But how many of them do you need and how can learning, would you ever get enough people who fit in this category to really address the social disruption issues here? And it's not clear. I, mean, I, I don't know what the numbers are. I'm not an uh, educator specialist. But if you, if you really, really e tried to get a classroom, would you ever get more than, say, 30% of the people to be like this? Don't know. I, I, and I, I welcome the discussion. So anyway, so based on the discussions and the idea of learning uh, concepts, we refocused the complexity lens. And we took the people, organizations, processes, and technology rows where the new set of columns were based on the discussion topics. And so uh, the, the issue of t uh, sort of uh, tech change was folded into tech, and the issue of timing of decisions was folded into processes. But otherwise, these columns are the issues that were, that were talked about. So, You've got labor issues, the general question of learning, trade and alliances, various things about migration, wealth inequality, role of government, role of private sector, and intersecting with each of the, um, of the rows. So then the rest of the discussion was, all right, let's step back, let's take a, um, a crude look uh, at these and focus on the intersections and interactions among these things at this point. So, of course, this being Singapore, we must have scenarios. Uh, and uh, so we uh, had three, uh, and one is mostly works out. So basically, the vision of the high-tech entrepreneurs is realized. Uh, in point of fact, uh, productivity is increased, new jobs are created, new wealth is created, and the system is robust enough, the system writ large, social system, political system, is writ large enough to handle the disruptions. Uh, the flip side of it is uh, enough people cannot absorb uh, the magnitude and the velocity of change leading to all sorts of domestic and international tensions that it really does become a national security problem, say, ranging from virulent nationalism to protectionism to cross-border migration. And then the middle one is, uh, okay, you get good enough policies and good enough governance, good enough collaboration, 
to help people cope. Uh, and you work with your alliance partners so that you're not completely working at cross purposes uh, to the differing uh, issues as they come up. You avoid Smoot Hawley and other beggar my neighbor trade policies and you re reduce the mass migration. Now, that was very interesting because a number of people said we always focus on the supply side in drugs and migration, whatever. But rather than just trying to close the borders, suppose part of this mitigation was to make conditions in the supplying countries good enough that you wouldn't have the incentives for people to leave. Um, so that's where we're then in the next iteration of the refocusing of the lens. So let me stop there for a minute. Any questions, thoughts? Sir? A couple of things. You're 30%. We'd better do better. And I am an educator, and I think there are things that we can do better. Beginning to emerge ways to do all of this. I very often show an image of a medieval class, which is exactly the same yeah. as the class we have nowadays. I think by getting educators to respond to their audience right. rather than talk to their audience could actually get a huge lot better. I was really struck yesterday by one of the discussions that said that you could actually get something like 95% of the students to an A level if you taught them one-on-one uh, -on -one or found ways to engage with them better than, you say, just lecturing to the class. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and there it's, it's really a question of how much can you invest right. in that one-on-one. Right. -on -one. Right, right, right. But another element that you did touch on sort of, but I, I think I'd like to raise, is the fact that we teach in kindergarten our kids to believe in truth. Okay. Uh, basically, we need to socialize them, so we tell them the same story, and so they all start interacting about that story. If we were to teach them alternatives, and the fact that there always are alternatives, uh -huh. and that you need to make conscious decisions that take unintended consequences of your choice into account, right. I think you'd go a long way to making a more adaptive attitude to how these kids ultimately uh, sort of uh, grow up. Uh, and then a, a last element that is close to what you're talking about when you talk about adaptive learning, and that is that nowadays in the medical sciences, but also in others, we work much more about problem-based learning and actually throw kids in a problem uh -huh. and then have them find out how they get out of it and what they can do with it. Right. That again is, I think, a technique that can improve this kind of statistic. So one of the things we had tried to do at National Defense University we sort of move away from the sage on the stage model of uh, the instructor pacing back and forth teaching to, if you will, the guide on the side of standing there trying to encourage them to do this, and just found the conservatism of the academe was breathtaking. And, uh, so I, I, I do not dispute for a moment what you're saying. I don't know how we solve the dual problems of getting the information to the kids, because first you have to get the information to the education system. Um, there's, a, there's a really incredibly depressing movie called uh, Waiting for Superman, which some of you, have you who have maybe seen it? And it was a story of uh, primary education in the United States uh, in the inner city. And the bottom line is there's some really very good schools called charter schools, uh, which have, you know, taking innovation. But the only way for an inner city mother to get her child into a charter school is a lottery. There's no way in the present system to get them there. Sir. I, I, I think you framed um, all, all of the issues extremely well. I, there, are, thanks. There, there are three things that it seemed to me compound the challenge. I mean, this is outside of the system right. that I tried to sketch at the beginning, but just focusing on this bit. The first one is, I guess, what I'd call the management of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and the management of technology is, is an extraordinary thing. I think Marshall McLuhan probably said it best back in 63, as I recall, where he said, our tools inform us after we have regulated our tools. Hmm. In other words, we take for granted in technological spaces today the availability of all sorts of things which no previous generation would even have dreamed right. of. And that shapes policy going forward. Right. So the way in which the technology space evolves is in part 
a function of the way in which society, through right. its legislators, in fact, in, in, engages with that space. The same thing applies, then, in the context of both, let's call it social fiscal policy, i.e., are you going to do income transfers and how? Right. And it also applies simultaneously in respect of education policy. So are we far enough ahead of this particular curve such that we're consciously addressing those sorts of challenges? And what instruments are we using for that purpose? Because if we're going to use the current educational force, particularly at primary and secondary mm -hmm. school levels, then by definition we're not going to do it for the same level of, well, you're going to get the same level of resistance right. that you were describing in respect to faculty at NDU. So the, the real issue that I think one's got to try and get one's head around in terms of these types of things is do we have the policy bandwidth to be able to address all of those dimensions semi-simultaneously right. in a frame that actually allows us to manage the future? Because otherwise the intervening period before human resilience manages to assert itself will be massively socially disruptive. And, you know, that, that for me is the core challenge. I would say to you the answer is no. Yeah, I would say too, but I, so I, would, it's a good I question. would say maybe we don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this isn't the policy bandwidth this year. You know, if you have a complex system, the agents within the system will interact and solve the problem through all the co IE self organization. In principle, but that's so not you, how we're if you, if you freed up the education system and took away control, you might actually get solutions emerging yeah. rather than trying to put in more controls to force the solution out. I don't know, it's just a thought. No. Can you really have a solution? There's a, a request for a mic back there. Somebody can, you, can you use the microphone? Oh, yeah. Well, we can, can I ask, answer, ask yeah. my question? Can you really have solutions to complex problems? So, I mean, the, one of the issues in the wicked problems is you, you, the best you can do is try to tame it. <laughs> there are a couple of things, one, one of which is that the minute you begin to try to solve the problem, you change the problem. And so the, any solution has got to be iterative. And one of the real issues for leadership is because all of our incentive structures, we, all of our incentive structures reward steadfastness and resolution. Uh, and I think that the, one of the things we came up with is that you, knowing that you, you, should, you should at least, every decision maker should build into the, uh, their process the revisiting and periodic in other words, the assumptions on which the decisions were based with the recognition that that may change the decision. But the way you have to articulate that to both above and to your team is say, okay, based on the best information I have now, we're going to do X. But I intend to, in six months, review this. And if the review indicates this need for change, then we'll make the change. So you've articulated that up front and then aren't just whipsawed of being weather, you know, weather veining and wimpy and things like that. Did you? Thank you. Um, I guess a lot of uh, people have been asking and talking about education, and um, so that's one of my pet uh, topics. Uh, um, so we've been looking at the past and the future of education um, through the lens of... of I'm sorry, you was... Uh, where are you? Uh, sorry, my, my, my colleagues and I at Applied Cognitive Science. Um, through the lens of cognitive science, and one of the things that we notice when we look at the past of education is that... Uh, I used to teach, we all thought we were doing a good job, but it turns out maybe not so much. Actually, the kind of econometric data says that literacy works. I mean, like the big sweeping change of making, making uh, populations literate is, has a brilliant kind of economic consequences. And everything else, if you look at, for example, Bowles and Gintis's research um, starting in the 80s, seems to suggest that um, teaching other kind of higher level subjects doesn't have any measurable effect. Wow. So I used to teach mathematics and, you know, it turns out that people who score higher in maths don't really do better kind of outside once they're working, but the people who kind of score better on are they socialized into uh, working in a hierarchical system on meaningless tasks for incremental rewards, they do better. <laughs> and so there's this kind of scary possibility that all of the kind of higher, higher levels of education beyond basic literacy and numeracy, might, we might not have actually figured out how to teach those things. And one of the things that we are beginning to believe is um, we need to change 
some of the definitions away from subjects and into skills, where right. you define a skill as, well, what can the person do better that they couldn't do before? And measuring that, and one of the kind of defects of current kind of credential-based, um, multiple-choice-based um, approaches is that it takes away the resources to actually define and measure skills. And so we don't, uh, my contention is, maybe we're not even there yet, and in fact, these problems are really revealing a kind of a fundamental uh, um, uh, miscon misconception about even the effectiveness I, of I'd, I'd love to go on with that. Let me, let me I, I, I think, uh, fascinating topic. Let me, let me just finish up here, but that's a great, a great topic. I mean, one of the questions we have a, you know, we have a two-year-old and a seven-month-old grandkids, and one of the questions was, other than times tables, alphabet, and www.google.com, I mean, what facts do they really need to know going forward? Okay, so we refocus then the lens because, again, we're looking at learning here. And so the effort was, all right, let's take the, the lens that was morphed, uh, refocused on the base of the discussion and try to apply learning to it. So clearly people are going to involve learning. So we looked at how they intersect with each of the columns and then the learning column, how it intersects then with, with, with each of the rows. So that was the sort of the third iteration of the lens we went through. And so, so some of the issues here, at, uh, just uh, in the course of those discussions, so for people in labor, so which jobs were going to be affected? Uh, very interesting sort of discussion about how do you decouple a sense of worth, sense of self-worth from sense of job, especially in America. I'm not so sure in Europe it's as important, but certainly in America it is. Uh, if you had alternative workforce, or like, like a, you became a gig worker or something like that, does that provide a sense of dignity, dignity for people? And how important is that? Um, at what point does job displacement yield to social unrest? I don't even know where the triggers are. And then the point that to come back uh, earlier is this issue of we underestimating human resilience and uh, the innovative genius. When you intersect then with people and learning, um, it's not just you know, what do the people and the unemployed people need to know about you know, the threats, this looming shadow of the future. When do you as a worker need to know that you ought to be thinking about in five years that your job may not be here and so start now. Just you know, Somebody said yesterday in the working track that uh, there, there's a movement afoot to make companies make their uh, automation plans more transparent to workers to give them a chance to, to begin planning. Uh, how do you respond to job loss? And then just some of the things in innovative, adaptive learning. Uh, again, how do you get to lifelong learning mindset? But could you use enhanced modeling and simulation to maybe uh, game the outcomes better? Uh, how do you share information? How do you support this distributed production? The question like added manufacturing and 3D printing, could you actually use some of this to, dis uh, to, to put more production locally and reduce some of the concentration? So talking about trade and alliances, and there's going to be a really, and again, with people, the impact of people on free trade is going to be pretty visceral. Uh, and so how do you maintain alliance relationships at the same time that your, your workforce and your local population may be demanding protectionism and, uh, uh, and uh, movements away from free trade? Uh, again, the people are going to respond to the migration pressures. Uh, where there's a lot of interesting studies that show of all, all the OECD countries, only the, I think the United States in 2030 is likely to show a growth in population and workforce entirely due to in, uh, immigration. So you know, how do you then convince people that that's actually a good thing for the country as a whole, even though their job may be at risk? Again, the wealth inequality, where the trigger points, uh, um, you know, how much reduction in inequality could you, you need? Somebody said again yesterday that most Americans don't particularly care. They're not as rich as Bill Gates. They don't see themselves competing with that, and so maybe the top 1% isn't an issue for most people. It's a point of research. And then how do you tee up the issues productively in at least the U.S. political system that tends to drive everything to left and right polemics? Um, and then people in government, again, wh how, how do you, what, what do the political leaders and the business leaders need to know about this? Um, learning in organizations, uh, how do you teach all levels of an organization that whatever the bureaucratic processes have done up to now, they're not going to work in the future? That you have to reexamine your assumptions and that you ought to incorporate foresight. And then in, in the U.S., with all the, I mean, Singapore's got a nice tight government with lots of uh, years of experience in this, how do you incorporate foresight? 
foresight processes in the U.S. Sheila gave me a really good lesson I hadn't focused on on the foresight network within the U.S. government that actually seems to be working better than I would ever have imagined it has. But uh, it, it's something that needs to be uh, worked on. This lessons observed, lessons learned. I mean, no lesson is ever learned to behavior changes. You observe a lesson, the next crisis comes along, you reobserve the same lesson, and you reobserve the same lesson. So how do you train, exercise, educate, and incentivize people to do things different so that you really do get the lessons learned? And then again, we need to start now to begin gathering data on just what this income redistribution would mean. If you set I mean, for the United States, a $30,000 minimum basic income would be about 50% of GDP. What does that do to the concept of a market economy? What does that do to the concept of the you know, U.S. vision of itself? What does it do to the creation of innovation? I don't know. It just now is the time to start gathering data. Um, so way ahead, so we came out of this. We said, okay, um, it looks like there are a few long-term projects. Because again, we don't yet know what the crisis is, and the last thing you really want government doing is stepping in and doing something before there's some evidence as to what it is they're supposed to be doing, is start gathering data. Uh, almost certainly we need to do better in public-private partnerships, because probably neither government nor business is going to get this right, and how do you find a way to, to work together? Uh, how do you frame the debate? And a very, somebody made a very interesting point that, look, wealth and income inequalities cannot and should not be eliminated if you want to have innovation and entrepreneurship thrive. So there has to be some level of inequality. And, uh, uh, and so on. what's the right level in the society we have going forward? Let's think about that now. And then again, teach children early so that they can begin to address these things. So the summary was, we, I think the lens at least helped me to look at a pretty complex, contentious issue. We started with a macro scope, when the macro scope kept the issue high. We started with this people, organization, processes, technology framework as a first cut. We then moved to the second stage with the additional columns. We then focused on learning by you know, looking at the intersection of some rows and columns. Uh, and if you wanted to focus on something else, if you want to say organizational design, you could go back and redesign those dots uh, to look at different intersections. Um, so right now, the long lead actions gather the data, frame the issues, and promote learning. Uh, and uh, I think the lens uh, let us get into some of this without getting bogged down in infinite statistics about, um, uh, about the problem, and we could use it for other parts of a wicked problem. I look forward next year to applying it in the course again. So over to you, ladies and gentlemen. So you know, questions. Um, we've got a good 15 minutes now. Um, and if you want to use the... I thought maybe uh, maybe we could do a bit of both and. Uh, uh, maybe what we should do is, and maybe if you two gentlemen could join another table so we could get some critical mass on the discussions on the table. be interested to know what are your key insights and your overall key questions. We'll do that for five minutes and then we can have a look and then individuals can stand up so we can do both and as well. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Great. Okay. That's <laughs> Okay, so I've already, I've already failed. Yeah, alt no what? No, alt what? I'll, I'll, I'll do it. No, just no worries. Tell me. Tell alt, me. Alt, alt, alt tab. Alt tab. Well, yeah, probably yeah. three times. Oh, there you go. Yeah, rock got it. and roll. Okay. I have already yeah. alt. The question is, what are your overall key insights? What overall questions do you have? We've already had some discussion already. I love to uh, um, Funnily enough, the Navy uh, uh, under Secretary of Labor actually had the earlier version of the software. I guess, I guess just after John Lennon stepped down as Second Navy, 
came in and fixed all that stuff. But I guess it was in the beginning of, uh, I guess it was, it was probably the beginning of Clinton when it was used very widely. When was base clerk? When was base clerk? Well, it then there's one yeah, thing where I sort of really... It started about 92. Okay. Well, it, was, it, was, it was in that sort of space right. that, that it was done, and there was a whole huge debate in policy terms as to whether you dared bring transparency to that process yes, because of its highly politicized nature. But, uh, but what I'm getting at is it's been used quite widely. Uh -huh. so and in Pentagon planning exercises as well to go with Delphi and all sorts of other sort of related things. And it strikes me that it might be quite useful. Oh, yeah, I'd love to see that. Good. So, so Sheila, just a thought. I mean, you might, depending on the problem, let's say the wicked problem is eradication of malaria. Okay, and there's the whole, bad, but you can actually get to an end state where you'd succeed it. If the if the objective is the eradication of po of poverty or or obesity, then you may never get to there. Yeah. Good point. But I think this is a, this is a, right, and I do think it is, it's kind of an important foundational issue because we have been so socialized to solve problems. Why don't we take two more questions on the, uh, on the tablet and then that'll be enough to talk for the rest of the time. The most important thing is what is called persistence, which means right. only that nobody dies out, but we don't care for the internal dynamics. The question is then, the question is what you mean by solving the problem, because that means, in many cases, a concept, a reconceptualization of what was, and what a solution. That's very Okay, so I think we have some good questions teed up. Let me just try to start addressing these then. Um, the, the people intelligence is really interesting, and uh, it, it's, it's, fairly, it's written fairly extensively in the paper, and I just left it out of the briefing. But um, as you look at this migration from artificial narrow intelligence to artificial... To, um, do you have a microphone? Can I bring it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can talk, yes. Okay. Yeah. To the artificial general intelligence, um, everybody says the way to go is to find an, uh, human augmentation. So it's not just people or machines, it's people plus machines. And so that's not just a problem of machine design, it's, it's education, it's organizational theory, it's management, how do you say, would you rather than have the, you know, Watson come in and get rid of all the paralegals, 
maybe there's something the paralegals should do in conjunction with Watson better than either could do by themselves. And so, uh, is that what you're kind of thinking of as people intelligence? Was that the, I'm not sure, table one. Right. I mean, I think that comes back to this beginning with a K through 12 education. It begins coming with a management. The whole batch of iterative processes here that you need to think of people and the machines together rather than separately. And hopefully that would wind up with an enhanced people intelligence. Um, what kind of roadmap from develop try to get these challenges? And then, um, yeah, so. So the way ahead here had uh, four broad things that are, you don't almost need a massive roadmap to do it. You could have, I mean, the, the teach children piece could be handled within the educational channel. The, the public-private partnerships, the whole batch of things, yeah, the, the whole batch of things going on with the public-private partnerships that, uh, that you could do now in present processes. I think this gathered data for the basis of future policies is really the closest thing I would come to starting a roadmap, and you would need to get the, you know, the education department, the commerce department, and the you know, the various departments together, and then you'd really need all the stakeholders and and sort of laid out in the class, public, private, whole of government, transnational, and say just what kind of data do we think we would need in say five years, ten years, whatever, when we need to begin making decisions, so. Uh, I wouldn't start this off, I don't think, as a massive roadmap because that would scare too many people and there's not enough consensus around the fact this is a problem. But I think it's a legitimate question to say what kind of education would we need as, an, as automation enhances, uh, that kind of thing. That's where I'd handle that. Um, how is the lens implemented here? What was the question there? Here being where? Here being in this problem, here being in Singapore, here being what, what's here? I'm sorry? Uh, in, in your particular case, when you're so trying to solve this problem. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we implemented the lens in the way, in the three-step process that I talked about and produced a, you know, a plan for a research plan basically to have information so that when the time came for decisions to be made, there would hopefully be answers on the table. That was the way we tried to phrase it. So in other words, the lens was uh, not necessarily a new way of looking at things, but a uh, solution. No, the, the lens was absolutely the way we looked at it. I mean, the, I think we would never have gotten to the kind of cross-cutting uh, approaches to different problems if we tried to look at each piece individually. So, I mean, I think the lens didn't really provide a solution. It provided a way provided to... Provided an approach? What? Approach, yeah, approach. Would you say that is a good general approach? What are your views on that? I would that? certainly use it again. I mean, I, I, think the, I think what I'd do is I would always start, and, and I'm, uh, we, we had a very interesting set of triangular approaches this morning, but um, I mean for me, I would always start with the people, processes, organizations, technology, because it forces you to think through, on the one hand, stakeholders, on the other hand, again, the technology and the way, when the handy way do business. And that, for me, then, would frame the second iteration was, okay, have a discussion based on those four things. That will lead you to more insights as to what the key issues are. And then the next step will be to examine the issues. Uh, right. So that would be the, I, I see it as an approach rather than a solution. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, how will the globalization of education affect these issues? So, so, so for example, frankly, I would have thought that the globalization of education and the repeated miserable showing of American students on the international tests would have provided more motivation than we've seen up to now for, for change. It doesn't seem to have. On the other hand, some of the things we're talking about here with adaptive learning may not necessarily be reflected in the scores you're seeing on international tests. 
you can have somebody who is extremely good at, uh, at taking standardized tests but may not be particularly innovative or adaptive and in, in responding to changing circumstances. Sir. Okay. So we've got maybe time just for one more. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess the question is, I'll take eight. Data suggests technology would advance so quickly people cannot adapt fast enough in the future. Uh, again, uh, there's a lot of stuff written. If you look at uh, Howard's TED Talk, there's a, there's a book by a guy named Barrett who's written a book called uh, Automated in, uh, Artificial Intelligence, Our Last Great Invention which basically says, you know, at some point uh, we, we, won't, we won't need any more inventions because the machines will be making it for us. Um, now that's, uh, so I, I really commend you to read those because there's an awful lot of, uh, of both responsible and scary writing out there about how this is something none of us has ever experienced before and it really does need to require new ways of thinking. So thank you, sir.